So hi, this is Mark at Skywagon University. We're interviewing Trevor Jacob, finding out uh, all about the uh, jumping out of the tailorcraft. We did part one, which was the why and, and background to it. And this second part is going to be how it was. So Trevor, thanks again for going over all this. Yeah, no problem. So thanks for finding out. So once you'd sorted out what you were going to do, how did you go about doing it? As far as the mechanics to yeah. pull it all together? Yeah, yeah. Cameras yeah. on the plane, flying it, getting out of it. Yeah. Uh, just to start off, I'll say that this has been a massive life lesson for me, and oh, yeah. I'm definitely moving on from this. But and I'm in part three, we're going to talk about the results of this, and the, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's bad. No, I mean, I definitely learned a lot, and I'm excited because, you know, this whole chapter of my life has really taught me what I want to do in the next chapter of my life in a massively positive, beneficial, value-adding to society type way. Good. Um, or at least that's my hope. So uh, this is, you know, something that has been a massive lesson for me. Um, so, but yeah, as far as wh or how, how I did it, where, where do you want me to start? I mean, do you want well, me to you, start with... You, bought, you got the plane. Yeah, I got the plane. Right, go from when you bought the plane to when you got out of it. Yeah, so I got the plane and then took the wings off of it and drove it down to the central coast here and uh, just and, had and just for everybody, what was the exact model year? What was the plane? It was a, it was a Taylor Craft, I want to say a BL69 or something? Or no, that doesn't sound right. BL, I don't know. I don't you, remember. You have known it long enough. I don't so remember. No. It was a, okay. a BL65, I think. So there's a 65 horse Continental in it. Yeah. 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 A uh, start, uh, a hand prop. Pan prop. A Hemingway yeah. starter. Farewell to arms. It must be, uh, yeah, I'm not, as you, so, as you know, since we've talked about what, what was, uh, you know, the details of the plane that I just got rid of with you. I don't, I don't know much about the mechanics, but uh, I, I know how to fly. Yeah. <laughs> but, so you, you got uh, it down here on a trailer. Yeah, I got it down here on a trailer and then put it together and, uh, you know, got kind of the idea of how I was going to do this silly stunt and took off out of Lompoc and, uh. Made, made, but, yeah. But yeah. you put GoPros all over it. Yeah. I bought about fuel and, and where you were going to go and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm in no way thinking that this is cool. I've gone, I've been through the ringer for this uh, stunt and it's definitely taught me a lesson, like I've said. So I'm in, I want to just make it clear that like I don't want to sound like I'm boasting about this being no, great. Would, would, I'm not proud of this. I think that especially me being a spokesperson for yo the younger generation of aviation and kids, like everyone's all into, you know, aviation social media now and posting their flights, which is obviously a huge distraction while you're flying, especially if you're not experienced. And there's a lot of young pilots that are probably somewhere deep down being like, oh, well, I could get views for this or blah, right. blah, blah. I should be talking to those people right now and saying, Dead. I'm living proof that especially I've gotten to know multiple people at the FAA very well because of this. You know, I'm not a mean person, I'm not a bad person, I don't think, and certainly some of these FAA people didn't think because they've been very, very helpful for me, and I've gotten to know these people. What I'm saying is they have told me how in detail they're watching youtube and they're watching all the social media to see little details of somebody that they're flying they're like oh this person didn't do this correctly boom yanked license gone like they're they're on this like hawks so anyway i feel like i could throw that in there and just be like and there's an edsb following everything anyway yeah and you're not like you're not going to go massively viral in aviation and it's just going to like change your life. I mean, like it could, you know, as far as like, um, not, not like you could be a beneficial, like what you're doing, you're adding value to aviation. You're showing, you're sharing like me, what I did, I took away from aviation in every possible way. I, I took like, not, no, like I get where I stand and I get where people stand that are viewing me watching this. And what I'm saying is I'm going to flip this whole thing around and be like, yeah, look at how big of a mistake this was. Look at what I've experienced and learn from it. Like right. don't, especially if you're younger because the younger generations of like dopamine and the clicks and the likes and the followers and all this stuff, it's like instant gratification. Yeah. And videos. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, I, I really want those people because I love flying. I love aviation. I paraglide. I skydive. I base jump. I fly planes. I fly paraglide, like paramotors, what all of it. I love aviation, and I love flying. 
and you know this whole thing has made me realize separate the two of of you know social media clout versus like the actual just love of flight right but something changes for everyone whether they want to admit it or not when you press that record button yeah so watch this yeah there's an there's in a real emergency the last thing you do is reach for a selfie stick. <laughs> yeah, the last thing, yeah. Before the cameras were just recording, we were saying yeah. that, yeah. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you the, just, you, you concentrate on the actual emergency. Yeah. So were you actually trying to, when you did it, were you thinking, I'm going to video this so it looks like a real emergency and fool people into thinking it's a real emergency? I mean, no, because, well, partially, and I'll explain why, is that when I did that and I acted and I, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, engine out, and I did this whole thing. And and by the way, I have zero, I have nothing to hide. I told a federal judge the absolute truth. So whoever's watching this is getting the absolute truth. I have nothing to hide. I explained every detail of this in court, in federal court. So I'm not going to sit here and <laughs> at you, you know. Right. So um, basically what happened was I decided to act as if it was an engine out and make it appear real and obviously, I mean, you have to be pretty silly to, to believe it. You have to be pretty, you know, not, not, who, not so... Who's on a normal day trip flying with 24 GoPros, right? Exactly. And a selfie stick and a parachute and, you know, like uh, fire extinguishers under their legs and, you know, a, a skydiving altimeter strapped to their waist. Like, um, yeah, you got you to gotta be like, oh, really? But it was all kind of for the saga of of the video and, the, video, and yeah. the whole thing and, um, and then what so how did you plan the 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 fuel not not having too much or not having not enough and where it would crash yeah so something that i'll throw in here that's really interesting is i was actually going to do it two days prior to the day i actually did that stunt and um i flew out there to where it was in a much different area than where i ended up doing it very vacant very you know nobody around not that that I mean, yeah, it is important, but, um, uh, and I noticed that I was flying and it just, something just didn't feel right. And I noticed that two of the GoPros had died and then it just kind of where I was and I, I didn't have phone service and the, just, it just didn't feel right. So I turned around anyway, where I'm going is the two days later is when I actually did it, which fell on the 50th anniversary of DB Cooper, who's the guy that jumped out of the plane with all the cash. Um, and I didn't even know who that was until I posted the video and someone's like, this is a conspiracy. This is fake. It's on the anniversary. I'm like, who's D.B. Cooper? I'm like, you oh, didn't even know who I had was. no idea. So I was like, whoa, Damn. that's crazy. It was 50, 50th anniversary to the day. Um, sorry, I went off track. What no, was the question again? No, it's interesting. No, the, so the, the fuel and the destination and the yeah. area, how did you choose all that? And, and, and how was it when you... Yeah, I was basically just... Um, all right, where is a... Originally, I didn't want to do it anywhere near any city at all. And I was going to try to just find a very, very, very secluded place in the desert. Like, and I was just going to take off in the dirt and just do it that way. The problem was that all the areas that I could find was the field elevation was too high for the 65 horsepower. And um, anyway, uh, I just found, you know, I staked out the area with some friends and just made sure that there was like nothing in the area nothing in that <clears throat> ravine or valley that I decided to make this poor decision um, and you know I made sure that there was minimal I, we flew, I flew the plane a little bit around and I realized oh this thing burns like no gas at all so four I, gallons now yeah. yeah I did I guesstimated fuel consumption but I just made sure it was probably like had like a third of the tank. And I knew it was like roughly, I think 25 miles from Lompoc. And um, I just kind of- Did you let did it, it run out or did you shut off? I shut off the mags. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Were you nervous? Uh, the only thing, I mean, no, like I don't want to sound, no, I wasn't. <laughs> um, I was just like, I remember I just was like, all right, well, you decided to do this, shut the mags off. And then I'm like, well, here we go. <laughs> like, there's not really any going back now. I mean, um, and then I, you know, I kind of made sure that the door is really tight in that thing, especially like flying it with a sports parachute, and which. And it's hard to open when it's moving. Yeah. yeah. I, I found it pretty weird, actually, that that flight manual for that plane had, it's it showed um, a section in that 
manual to adjust the seat for a parachute. And I found that pretty interesting that it was actually in the Taylorcraft manual. It said, uh, like, you know, do this, this, and this to adjust for parachute war uh, use. So there was but, enough room. Yeah, but I mean, it didn't really work for me. But uh, anyway, yeah. The was it difficult to get out of it? It looked tight. Well, I was flying. I had like a, you know, the parachute on and I'm like flying it like this. And yeah, it was, it was difficult. And I had, I think I cut off the step. Just to, it's just stuff to make sure I didn't get snagged. Um, but then I jumped and I, as soon as I jumped, I just looked back at the plane and I said, in my own head, my voice is like, you just made the biggest mistake of your life. And you also just made the most expensive mistake of your life. And then that was that. Not really any going back from there. And, mm. yeah. so, do you, so on the way down, you saw the plane. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, as soon as I jumped, of course. Um, and How then, many jumps have you done? Skydives? Mm. Thousands and thousands. Oh, so you're like pretty comfortable. Yeah. yeah. I, I stopped counting, but I have many thousands of jumps. Yeah. So you can orient yourself and a camera pretty easily to follow it. Right? Just like you and I talking right now. Oh, really? You know? Just like no big deal. Yeah. And I, and I don't want to sound like fool myself. I just spent no, no, a facts. lot of, I spent it's, years no, it's, of my life. Yeah. Up a, yeah. yeah. So I, I was just, I, you know, I jumped and just like looking back for the plane. And I, I was surprised the plane actually, I thought it would just spiral really quickly. But you trimmed it when you jumped. No. I don't even think that thing had trim. Or, or yeah, it does. Or, I don't even know if it worked, honestly. Like, uh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just, you know, jumped and then um, I was surprised. I was like, wow, I thought it would, you know, kind of just drop and spiral. But this, it was just sitting there. And then I kept looking back and then finally I pulled my parachute and I looked up and I didn't, didn't see it anywhere. And then I figured out, oh, it's right above me. It's above the parachute. So then I started like turning to try to see it. And it was just going so slow in these big circles, like so far. And where I had strategically planned for the plane to land, had I jumped like, <clears throat> excuse me, had, had I jumped like maybe 500 feet lower or higher, it would have completed another half circle to land right where I wanted it to. But it didn't, and it went up this ravine, which made everything else a lot more difficult for me. Yeah. Because on the video, you're fighting your way through brush. So how far yeah. from the plane did you land? That's the funny thing, too. I, I noticed, and I remember, I haven't looked on YouTube in quite a while, but uh, I remember people saying, like, he, you know, this is such BS, which partially it was, but, like, the, you know, all that stuff of me climbing out, people like, he's so dramatic, terrible acting, that was all real. As soon as I hit, as soon as I landed in the bushes of the parachute, and I, I was like stuck and I couldn't get out and I was like literally like stranded in this bush. And then I climbed like 30 feet down from this poison oak and I crawled on my hands and knees. It took me two and a half hours to get from where I landed because basically I was going to land right next to the plane. And as soon as I got maybe a thousand feet from the ground, this massive headwind hit me. And so I couldn't get there. I was maybe a, you know, half a mile or a quarter mile away but I just like my, my parachute wouldn't penetrate the wind fast enough. So I just couldn't get mm. to the plane. So it took me two and a half hours to get there. To hike um, to it. Yeah. On my hands and knees, like dr just barely. And then once I got there, I didn't have phone service. There was no, wa I had water in the plane and had all this, you know, survival stuff. And it was all just disintegrated and gone. Um, so then that's when the real journey started. And I literally had to climb down like over a 5,000 foot mountain to this valley um, and then walk through the sand like 15 miles back and then you know I notified a friend this is the thing I like, ran into some farmers is what I said in the video but basically I notified a friend to like hey if you don't get a hold of me meet me here and he, that that property it was like a private property so anyway this my friend had to find these ranchers these farmers and they went on this like big mission to try to find their friend that crashed their plane and uh that ended up taking, I crawled on my hands and knees down this mountain through this ravine for like 11 hours. It was like, or maybe even longer than that, 12 hours, because it was 11 o'clock at night. And I finally found, I saw cows. And I was like, cows, like something, like there's a cow. And keep in mind, I'd been in literally the thickest brush, like for the longest time. And uh, then I see like this water, like a, like a literally cow shit pond of water like this little thing and i just started drinking the water because i needed water i was so depleted and, and i'm you, like and you told me earlier you, you were poison oak from head to foot yeah but i didn't know at this point i knew i was in poison oak 
Oh, but I didn't yeah. know how bad I had gotten it. And you get poison oak. Oh yeah, big time. But I was cut. I was I was re like completely. My whole body was getting cut from all the sticks and the bushes, so which makes the poison oak actually enter oh, you yeah, so yeah. much better. Um, so I ended up yeah, I had two and a half months of just head to toe every nook and cranny poison oak i wanted to be sedated it was so it was worse i've broken bones had all types of surgeries i've broken literally like everything in my body that was so bad and i actually told the judge in in court i was like this is mother nature's punishment to me um and i think i deserve it you know and instant karma yeah so anyway people were like oh he had people behind the camera no i literally was drinking out of cow shit water and then i literally i laid down on the side of this little pond because I gave up. I'm like, all right, I have no phone service, nothing. Like, I'm just going to sleep here for the night. I'm exhausted. So I lay down in the freezing dirt, and all of a sudden I see car headlights. And so that's when I turned the camera back on, and I, like, show the, oh, farmers found me. And people were like, you're so full of it. I'm like, no, they actually did. But that was the but, farmers with your friends saying, let's look for camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were, they were giving up. They were, they were giving up, and they were turning back. And they literally, like, as soon as they were turning back, they found me. But, yeah, yeah. So then you're out of it, but you know the plane's still up on the hill. Yeah. So, so what do you have to do about that? That's is, when... Is like, that littering? Yeah, it, it actually is. I guess it's a massive, massive fine. And, you know, again, I'm in no way condoning. I think what I did stupid, and I could have gone about it, gone about it in a professional stunt-like way, but I didn't take any of those cautionary steps mm. and that was super stupid of me i've made a massive mistake i also want to just apologize for everything and everybody that was you know offended by my, my, by my action because i didn't think it would make as many people so upset just but now that i see why every, i just see the whole picture now um but yeah i got got out of there and then you know came back got poison oak just so bad the next couple of days and i was just like oh my gosh but then um and who when, knew you'd done it at this point? Basically, the farmers, your buddies, you. Yeah. But no one had reported a plane crash. No. It was just yeah. gone. Yep. And then I just decided, I just called the NTSB and just said I crashed my plane. And I wanted to be kind of vague about it because I was afraid at this point because I did talk to multiple lawyers that were like, oh, you're not breaking any laws. You know, it's just kind of, you just report it as an incident and blah, 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 blah. Which, at the time... Me being just, you know, the life that I've lived, for better or worse, I had zero legal experience or anything. Not that that makes it okay, um, but these lawyers were like, thank God, not, not the lawyers that I had end up, you know, defending me and saving my life, really. Um, but other lawyers were like, yeah, you're, you're good. And so I just, okay. So I just called them and reported a crash. And uh, that's kind of where the chaos Is began. Is that where it all started? <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, yeah. So um, before we go to the third segment, which talks all about that, yeah. what happened to the plane? Where is it? Well, how did you get it out of yeah, there? So Can you tell us how you dealt with that? Sure. So um, basically, I grew up in Mammoth, which is out in the, in the mountains, mm -hmm. and I would volunteer with cleaning up after like massive weekends all the people from la or wherever would would leave all their trash you know at campsites and and i would actually help volunteer with the forest service and i would clean up trash um so I, that was kind of instilled in me as a child and you know every time i would go to bed after that night that i crashed the plane it just sat with me like i can't have that trash out there in the mountains like that was my true intention i'm like i can't that was, was anybody looking for it no not NTSB? Not yet. Okay. But I was like, my mind just, like, I just couldn't sleep. You know, mm -hmm. and people out there might not even believe this, but it's just you and me talking. Like, I literally was like, I can't. I caused that. That random innocent mountain has this crumpled up plane on it. And, like, that's my fault. I'm going to get it. When it hit, did it, did it just stop or did it leave a trail? Did no, it, it, it literally just, it literally just went right into the mountain and just made this big boom noise. But it was all condensed right there. Mm. So... Anyway, um, this is where I lied to the NTSB. I was just afraid and I was getting, you know, advice from lawyers that literally said, don't tell them where it is and tell them that you don't know where it is. So now I'm all of a sudden in this legal dilemma where I'm like, oh, this could get really serious. And mm. lawyers are telling me not to tell them. Horrible idea, by the way. It felt in my gut. I'm like, no, I got to tell the truth. I do know where it is. But they're like, no, tell them that you don't know where it is. So I made that mistake, which is super stupid. And um, 
I hired a friend with a helicopter, not a friend, but I hired a helicopter and, you know, I went in there with choker straps and another friend and I just lowered myself. I had this on film. I actually filmed it and then I deleted the footage which would be interesting to share with the people now because it's like really incredible footage of it. Well, you were on the end of a rope. Hanging down, I, I, I like rappel down like 30 feet. I cleaned up everything as the A-star is just hovering. I got all the choker straps. I tie this thing together alone and my friend's filming. And, you know, I just cleaned up every single piece of trash. There was not one piece of glass or fi nothing. I clean. I threw everything inside the was plane. Was it all still connected? Yeah, it was in the exactly the struts kept kept the wings together. So I folded the wings by myself. This is me just like manhandling a plane in the woods by myself or in the bushes, and I tied everything together. I climbed back up in the A star, and we towed the entire plane back to a trailer, and then towed it back to the airport. And then I was just like, well, what do I do? And a lawyer literally was like, just get rid of the plane. So I a cut lawyer it, told you. Yeah. So I cut it up and just got rid of it. I threw it in some trash bins and like, okay, it's gone now. But then later on, I found out that, you know, the sheriff helicopter and all these got these, these, I saw this in the discovery of the case with the footage of them looking for the plane. And it's just like, it's gone, you know? Did they know where it was before you found it? No. Okay. So I was just like, okay, well, I'm just going to, you know, pretend. I didn't know at the time, you know, that they were in active pursuit with helicopters to look for it. Uh, and then it pissed them off even more, which understandably so, that they're but like, do oh, you, do you, this you went and got it in the middle of the day. Yeah. Not at midnight or anything. No, no, no. I mean, this is out there, but there's just like, okay. But you hadn't posted the video yet. Right. I have not. I okay. had not. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, and again, this is stupid. I went to federal prison for this. This is like, this is dumb. <laughs> shit that I just got myself into a really <laughs> position. There was absolutely, you know, um, enticing, you know, money and things involved. Even though that originally wasn't the true intention, I wanted to do this as a bucket list thing. But all of a sudden, these external factors mm. of money and sponsor and views and blah, 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 gets involved and it kind of can cloud your your true vision or intelligence of and like- judgment. Yeah, judgment of like, this is just a <laughs> show altogether. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I got rid of the plane and then it made the, you know, the investigators like really pissed off. They're like, oh, when this- When did that start? The investigation like people started calling and uh, when did it maybe like a week later and that's probably like one of the lawyers was like you should just go get rid of it before they find it i'm like well that doesn't sound sketchy that's horrible that's not a, okay but yeah anyway that's the price that you pay and i, I learned my lesson and um you know i definitely shouldn't have done that I, d I shouldn't have done any part of this and but you know here we are and i hope to be a voice for good for people to one yeah you can look at me how oh that guy's an idiot I'll agree. I'll, I'll agree yeah. with you. No problem. We all make mistakes. Um, I'm here to share. Like this is the story. This is what happened. And you know, let's let's yeah, move on from it. You're admitting it exactly. Yeah. yeah like no, I'm not trying to. See. <laughs> yeah. So. So good. So that is how. So this is the end of part two. So there's going to be a third video, which will be all the ramifications of what happened next. Yeah. So thanks for watching. This is Mark at Skywagon University, and we've got a subscribe and a little bell you can click on for notifications. And Trevor, thanks very much, and we're going to see you in part three. See you guys in the next one.